Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome along to this uh, very special uh, data science festival uh, sandbox session in partnership with, with Dunhumby. Um, I say this is a special sandbox session because uh, it's been something that we've tied in uh, with our main data science festival May Day conference this year. Uh, we hosted our May Day conference uh, just this Saturday, just gone. Uh, great fun. I'm, I'm still a little bit tired, uh, but we've tied this in as a, as a partner event uh, to be able to reach a wider audience. Um, and it's something that Dunhumby suggested to us um, a couple of years ago, actually. We've, we've done it for a couple of years now. Um, and as a really valued partner, it's really nice idea that Dunhumby have had to uh, make the Data Science Festival uh, festival week uh, open to people around the UK and also around the wider world. So uh, very much uh, glad to be here and, and, and doing that today. Um, in terms of today's session, uh, to buy or not to buy, that is the question. Um, we're being joined by David Hoyle, who's a lead data scientist at, at Dunhumby. So uh, if it's OK, David, I will ask you to turn on your uh, camera and your microphone and uh, join me. Join me on stage if that's OK. Hi, hopefully you can hear me OK. I can hear you very well, sir. How has your day been so far? Yeah, good so far. I'm going to get even better, I hope. I love it. I love that confidence. Love that energy. It feels it feels quite good. This actually, it feels like we've had the conference festival, and like this is almost like a special after party that Dunhumby have organised to to get us all along to. So uh, yeah, de definitely looking forward to it. Um, David's uh, a lead data scientist at, at Dunhumby. Um, thirty five years experience in statistical and mathematical mo modelling, uh, with a PhD in theoretical physics. Uh, had you know a long academic career uh, covering University of Cambridge, University of Exeter, uh, and University of Manchester. Um, and I spent the last 13 years in, in the private sector uh, with Lloyds, with Autotrader, uh, and obviously with, with Dunhumby, uh, which I did notice, David, was, was two, two separate occasions. They, they, they enticed you back, did they? They did, yes. They're, they're a good bunch. I can see why. I can see why. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen here, David, uh, and we'll get your presentation up and ready to go. Uh, and then we'll go from there. And just as you're doing that, just as a reminder, I'm, I'm sure people that have joined before will, will know this, but uh, we do have the chat and the Q&A feature uh, open. Um, we do ask if you have a question, please, please do put it into the Q&A. Uh, it just makes it easier for us to, to manage at the end. Uh, but equally, feel, feel free to say hello in the chat as well uh, as you're watching along. Um, but yeah, if I could get you to share your screen, David. Yeah, uh, okay. that'd be great. Let me just uh, share This felt like it was forever away and then all of a sudden it's happening so uh it's come around quick how's the preparation gone for it um yeah it's it's it's, it's gone very quickly i mean I, I ironically i'm doing almost a very similar presentation to the company in an hour's time so oh, good um, little bit yeah, of practice so, so it's, 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 it's good practice yeah amazing stuff amazing well, this, stuff. This, well, will, this will be the better one now i'm i'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm now. sure i'm <laughs> sure um, awesome awesome well that that looks great david so um if you're happy uh yeah, I'll maybe just get the presenter view. Yeah, hopefully you can see my slides okay there. Everything looks perfect. So I'll, I'll leave you to it. Uh, as I say, I'll be watching along in the background and uh, jump in for the Q&A at the end. So have a good session. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So um, to buy or not to buy, it's a very cheesy title there. But what essentially I'm going to be talking about is um, how we can use data science to predict what shoppers will buy in a grocery retail setting. Okay. So to give a broader um, outline of my talk, inevitably I'm going to start with a bit about the company I work for, Dunhumby. And in Dunhumby, we use demand models. So that means I'm also going to explain what a demand model is. Um, and that will bring me on to what we can actually use a demand model for. Uh, I'll then move on to some of the challenges we face when building a demand model. And then towards the end, I'm actually going to then introduce some, some mathematics. I haven't been able to remove all equations from this talk, I'm afraid. There is a bit of mathematics, but I'll be talking about the kind of mathematics, the mathematical form that we use for these demand models. And then at the end, I'll finally wrap up with some key takeaways from this talk. OK, so let's start on that first point then. Um, Dunhumby, we're a customer data science company. Um, that means we do data science using customer data, customer purchase data, transaction data, typically from grocery retailers. So this is supermarket data. Uh, the client, you know, data about the kinds of things you can see in that picture on the right, data that's in uh, products that are in supermarkets. We're actually fully owned by Tesco. So if you have heard of us before, it may be because of the Tesco club card in the UK. 
but we're actually a global company. We have global clients. Um, that means we have global impact. Um, one of the statistics I like to quote about Dunhumby is that our clients combined active shopper base is around about 1 billion shoppers, 1 billion customers. So what that means is that when you make a change to a data science algorithm in Dunhumby, you're potentially impacting around about one in eight people on the planet. Okay, but what do we do for those clients? Well, we help them optimize their business. And that can be optimizing anything from the assortment, that is the range of products that the retailer sells, or it could be all the way through to optimizing how those products are marketed, how they are priced, how they are promoted. Um, and it is the price and promotion bit of Dunhumby that I work for. Um, and that price and promotion part of Dunhumby is based in the Manchester UK office of Dunhumby. And that price and promotion work involves using demand models to do things like price optimization. So that brings us on to what is a demand model? The demand model is something that helps a retailer answer the basic question, how much of this product am I going to sell? It is a mathematical equation. We have one of these demand models for each of the products that a retailer will sell. Um, they're all of the same mathematical form. They just differ in the actual numerical values of the parameters that uh, each demand model has. Okay, I've got a little schematic here of a demand model, as you can, and as you can see from it, it has various inputs, um, and it predicts or outputs a prediction, a prediction of how much that product is going to sell given those inputs. But what are those inputs? Well, the inputs we want to use are, is, uh, is going to be anything that materially or significantly impacts the sales volume of that product. The most obvious of which is the product's own price. But what is that relationship between the price of a product and its sales volume? Well, for the kinds of products that you'll see in a supermarket, the relationship between its price and its sales volume follows a well-established economic law. As the price goes up, sales volume goes down, as indicated by the little schematic here, the black dashed line in that graph. Um, the slope of that graph, the gradient of that graph, can actually give us some useful information. That gradient tells us how price sensitive customers are to uh, the actual product. Um, and that is useful insight that we can give back to a retailer. So once we've built a demand model by training it on historical data, we can actually calculate that gradient at any point along that curve, at any price point, and we can give that insight, that price sensitivity calculation back to the retailer. And that's useful for the retailer because it tells them um, the price sensitivity of each of the products in their assortment, and consequently allows the retailer to work out which products do they need to be most price competitive on. When we're doing that um, price sensitivity calculation, we actually do it on a log scale. In other words, we look at um, percentage changes in price. And the reason for this is that customers are sensitive to fractional or percentage changes in price. So if you think about it, a $1 increase on a product that normally costs $100 will have, a, will have less of an impact compared to say a $1 increase uh, in the price of a product that costs $5 normally. So it is fractional or percentage changes that matter, not absolute changes. So that means that when we're actually doing that price uh, sensitivity calculation or quantification, we actually look at the gradient of the log of the units sold against the log of price. And we call that the direct price elasticity. Sometimes it's also called the own price elasticity. Okay. But it's not just the price of the product that matters, it's the price of other products that matter as well. So here I've got a little schematic, I've got a group of three different cola drinks, and I'm going to decrease the price of one of those drinks, one of those cola drinks. I'm going to decrease the price of product A, and that's going to cause its sales to increase. Um, in this case, it will go from, say, free, selling three units a week to eight units a week. But part of that increase is just stealing sales from other cola drinks in this category. I'm stealing some sales from that B uh, brand drink and also from the other cola drink on the left. We call this stealing of sales cannibalization. Okay, And from a retailer's perspective, it is not good. Yes, the sales of A have gone up from three units a week to eight units a week. 
But overall, in that whole COLA category, we've only gone from 10 units a week to 11 units a week in total. So that's only an increase of one unit a week in the category overall. So from the retailer's perspective, it's not actually been a very successful promotion. We've only increased by one unit. OK, why are we seeing such strong cannibalization in this case? Well, it's because the products are very similar to each other. They're all COVID drinks. That means they're all substitutes for each other. And knowing which products are substitutes for each other is vitally important in demand modeling. In fact, the substitution relationships are uh, is an input into the demand modeling process. And those substitutability relationships form a network, a graph. Um, and we can use historical transaction data to uncover the shape of that graph, that network. Um, and in fact, we have algorithms to do that in Dunhumby. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about that, those algorithms. That's a whole different part. Uh, that's a whole other talk. Um, but I will touch come touch upon that graph later on. I'll come back to it uh, and talk briefly about it uh, in a, in, a, in a later slide. But for now, you know, it's an input into the demand modeling process. And just when, as like when we use the direct price elasticity to quantify the effect of a price's own product on its own sales, um, we can actually quantify the strength of the cannibalization uh, relationships that we have present. So for each of those uh, directed edges in that uh, substitutability network, we can calculate a cross price elasticity. Again, we look at things on a log scale. And the cross price elasticity is telling us the impact of the price of, say, a product B on the sales of product A. Once we have those pr cross price elasticities estimated from our built demand model, then we can actually use them again to give insight to the retailer. So, for example, we can use them to calculate how much genuine new sales have we got when we run a promotion, as opposed to how much is the uplift in sales is coming from cannibalization, moving things around just within the category. And that's useful to a retailer because they can work out whether the promotion has been successful or not. OK, let's get back to our demand model. So we've already indicated that price of a product and prices of other products are inputs into a demand model. But what are the other inputs that we need to take account of? Well, obviously, how we promote and display a product is going to have some impact upon its sales volume. So, for example, if you put a product on the end of an aisle in the supermarket, it will tend to sell more than if you, say, put it on the middle of an aisle in the supermarket. Likewise, things like uh, time, temporal effects uh, have an, uh, an, an impact upon sales volume. So things like seasonality has an impact. Um, so certain products sell more in summer compared to winter, for example, ice creams. OK. Holidays can also have an impact. So in the UK, you might see some products have spikes in sales around Christmas and Easter. In the US, you might see increases in sales also around Thanksgiving. OK, what we've got here is a very schematic or high level overview of what a demand model is and what the inputs into it are. But let's, what I'm going to do now is actually show you some examples of those real inputs, because it will highlight some of the challenges that we face when we build these demand models. So what I've got here is some real data. Um, on the x-axis, I've got time, as indicated by week number. So the week number is going from 1 to 156. So I've got 156 weeks of data here. So it's just uh, you know three years' worth of data. On the y-axis, I'm showing the level of sales, the units sold, and the price. I've removed the scales from the primary and secondary y-axis, and I've removed all the details about the product for obvious commercial sensitivity reasons. But you can see from this plot, from the orange uh, line to start with, that the price of this product is roughly held constant for a lot of the three years. But there are periods where we decrease the price of this product uh, and we're promoting it in, the, in these situations. We're running some sort of price discount. And you can see there that there are corresponding spikes or increases in sales volume. So the link between price decreases and sales volume is, is clear. But you can probably also see from looking at the periods where we're not promoting, where we're not decreasing the price, that there's still a lot of movement in the sales volume in that blue curve. So there's a lot of potential noise in this data series. There's also other systematic variation. Um, also, if you look at that orange curve, you'll notice that, that there's actually only four distinct price points uh, in that series. So there's only four price points or four data points, essentially, or four different values of price that we can make use of when we're quantifying that relationship between price and sales volume. 
So this is going to be challenging data to build a model for. And yet this is fairly typical of what we will see. But let's go back to that uh, blue curve. As I said, we've got spikes in sales where we're promoting it, where we're decreasing the price. But underneath that, in the other periods, we've got some remaining systematic variation and we've got some noise. What could be causing that other systematic variation? Well, seasonality is one of the things we mentioned. And what I've got here in this plot is that same data. But what I've done is I've passed that data, that blue series, through a fairly basic low pass filter. And that's removed the actual spikes, uh, the promotional spikes from the data. I've then also run a moving average uh, um, over the data. So what I'm getting out of this at the end is the slow variation in the data that's not due to any promotional spikes. Um, what I'm uncovering is this slow variation, hopefully seasonal patterns. OK, you can see here from what we've got remaining, uh, I've got two broad peaks in this data or two broad humps, hills in the, in, in, in the uh, remaining variation. The first hill or peak has got a bit of a dip in the middle of it, but roughly there are two broad um, sections. Those two broad peaks are, 100, sorry, are 52 weeks apart. So we've got a yearly seasonal pattern in this data. And this is variation that, would we, that we would want to capture as part of our modeling process, um, because we want to make accurate predictions uh, for this particular product. So how do we capture it? Well, we can do that by including suitable basis functions. So we might include in our feature sets, say, a sine wave, or we might include some finite support basis functions. We might include some spline functions in, in our modeling. But that's easy to do. We just think we know how to calculate those values and we include them. Um, they're just extra features in our modeling process. OK, but contrast that slow, gradual variation occurring uh, you know, yearly over this three year period with what can happen when, or when we're looking around holidays. So here I've got another real data set. It's a different product, but you can clearly see in this case the impact that Christmas has upon the sales volume. As we get to Christmas, each Christmas, there's a big spike in sales volume. OK, again, this is variation in data that we would want to capture. And again, we can do that very easily by including appropriate basis functions. So in this case, we might include some fairly narrow a uh, basis function, maybe a top hat function, a half function. We might just include dumb, a single dummy variable that's centered over Christmas uh, each year. OK. But those uh, those uh, holiday spikes and the seasonal variation that we so showed in the previous example are very regular patterns of variation. But there are other patterns of temporal variation that we can see in our data um, that are challenging uh, or can be challenging to capture. So one of the ones I want to highlight is uh, things like structural breaks. A structural break is where we see a sudden and fairly localized change in level of sales. OK, so it's not a regular pattern. We don't know when it's going to occur. And yet our modeling process has to be able to take account of it. When we're building a model of this data, we have to actually be able to detect that structural break and take account of it. So we also have patterns in our in our temporal patterns in our data that are not regular, but we do need to take account of them. OK, so that's uh, what a demand model is and the inputs into a demand model. Now let's move on to why you might actually want a demand model. Or more specifically, what can you use a demand model for? Well, you can actually use a demand model for a very wide range of different use cases. They cover the full range of the Gartner Analytics staircase, if you've seen that before, all the way from the descriptive analytics use cases on the left here to the prescriptive analytics use cases on the right. The most obvious use case of a demand model is to do some sort of forecasting. So forecasting some sort of you know, forward looking scenario, telling the retailer what might happen for that particular scenario. But we can actually use a demand model to do counterfactual forecasting that's backward looking. So we can actually use a demand model to forecast what would have happened in a baseline scenario um and compare that baseline scenario to a historical promotion so this is saying right we've got a historical promotion a promotion that we did run we saw some increase in sales but what would have been the sales had we not promoted had we not run that promotion and that gives us a way of assessing the performance of the promotion we can then do that in a, a fair amount of detail 
Uh, and we can then say to the retailer or give that insight back to the retailer saying, okay, this is the amount of uplift you got. This is how much of it was due to genuine new sales. This is how much of it was due to cannibalization. This is how much of it was due to seasonality and so on. Okay. And that gives the retailer a diagnostic window on the performance of their promotions because it tells the retailer how effective that promotion has been, which were, which were, which were, were the promotions that were uh, effective in bringing new sales in, which were the ones which were not effective in bringing new sales in. And obviously then the retailer can choose to rerun the effective ones next year and not rerun the ones which weren't effective. So that's how we can use the demand models in a diagnostic uh, analytics setting. I've already mentioned that we can use the demand models to do things like calculate price sensitivity of the products. And that's using these demand models in a descriptive capability. We're using the demand models to characterize or describe the properties of each of the products in the retailer's assortment. At the very far hand side, we've got prescriptive analytics. And that's where we're using these demand models to do things like price optimization. Because we can control some of the inputs into these demand models, um, such as the price, we can then use these demand models to work out what is the best price at which to sell the product to achieve some desired financial target. So, for example, we might have a target uh, increase in sales volume that we want to achieve or a certain target um, you know, profit level, or we might want to optimize profit. And we can do that calculation very easily once we've built or once we've trained our demand models, uh, because that price optimization is just another numerical calculation. In, and we've got a mathematical equation in our demand model. So in other words, this price optimization, just another numerical calculation. And in principle, we can just use an off the shelf optimizer to do that price optimization for, for us. I say in principle, it's a bit more complicated than that. But in principle, you know, we've got a mathematical equation here where you can use it to do optimization. Okay. So underpinning all those use cases is one demand model. So we're using one more demand model to do all those things. Now, that means that the output from that demand model has to be very robust uh, and it always has to be sensible output. We can't afford for the demand model to be giving ludicrous uh, predictions. OK, and the reason being is we're using the demand model across all these different scenarios. And some of these scenarios and use cases may be quite a way away from the actual scenarios and data on which the model was trained. In other words, we're using the demand model potentially out of sample and quite a long way out of sample. And yet we still need the model to produce a sensible output prediction. Now you may say, okay, well, why use one demand model to do all these tasks? Why not use a separate demand model to say to do the price sensitivity calculations and a separate model to do the uh, price optimization? The reason we use one demand model across all these tasks is all these tasks form part of the retailer's price and promotion strategy. So all these different tasks are actually linked up in one sort of overview. So the retailer needs the output of these different tasks to be consistent with each other. And there needs to be some sort of agreement between them. Um, and that's why we use one demand model, because it can be difficult enough explaining to a stakeholder why you're getting differences uh, from one model across different scenarios. Imagine how difficult it will be if we had to reconcile the output of several models for the same product, for the same stock keeping unit across these different tasks. So that's why we keep to using one demand model to do the to do all these set of tasks and why we then need that one demand model to always produce sensible output and therefore always produce robust output. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that a demand model is useful and you know what the inputs into a demand model are. But now let's look at how we go about building these demand models. So the first thing to ask is, well, what do we actually need to build a demand model? Well, you've probably already guessed since I've already mentioned it. We need data. We train our models on historical data, uh, typically transaction data. So the retailer will give us transaction data that's coming from their point of sale systems. That data is very granular. It's also, you know, obviously, you know, coming at the level of seconds and weeks, uh, seconds and minutes. We will uh, typically use, say, around about three years worth of data. And that's because we want to estimate things like seasonal and holiday effects. These are regularly repeating patterns. And so we need to see several years worth of data to be able to identify those regularly repeating patterns. But as I say, it's the transaction data that's given to us uh, by the retailer from their point of sale systems. But we can actually aggregate that data up to a much higher level. 
And that's because of what the retailer is doing. Typically, the retailer will keep the price of a product fixed for a week. So although the actual point of sales transaction data that it's given to us is at the level of, say, set, you know, seconds, it's every basket that's coming through, every transaction that's coming through. For all the transactions inside a week, well, we got the same, you know, for a given product, we've got the same price. And also the retailer will have the same price in a collection of stores, a price zone. So that means we can use the one model for all the transactions in that price zone and for all the transactions within a given week. So we can aggregate the data up to the product price zone week level. Um, that means we're working actually when we're doing this model building uh, with much smaller data volumes. And that makes the model building uh, a, a lot easier. But as I mentioned uh, from those previous slides, it's not just the price data and the sales volume data we need. We also need promotion data as well. Typically, the promotion data doesn't come from the point of sales systems. And so sometimes we can face issues with getting those two sets of data aligned and there can be data quality issues, particularly with the promotion data. So that can be one of the challenges that we face. But obviously, first input into building a demand model is training data. The other input we need is something that I touched upon a moment ago, and that is that uh, graph of substitutability relationships. I mentioned that we already have algorithms in Dunhumby that will, will uncover that network uh, structure for us or quantify that network structure for us. That quantification will be output in the form of an adjacency matrix. And I've got a little schematic here. Um, a 10 by 10 matrix, so indicating 10, uh, you know, 10, 10 products. Often one of the things we want to do is simplify that matrix. We want to identify blocks or groups of products that are interacting with each other strongly and less interacting less strongly with uh, other products. Um, so in other words, we want to break that adjacency matrix down into a much more sparser structure, as indicated by the schematic at the bottom right, where I've identified a group of four products that are strongly interacting, another group of three products, and then a final group of three products. Okay, so in other words, we want to do some community detection on that graph structure. Okay, one of the advantages of doing that is once we've identified a set of interacting products, we can actually then sort of ignore the uh, remaining products when we're building our model. So say I want to build a product, um, a model of the first product indicated, you know, represented by the first row. So there are, each row in that matrix represents a product uh, and the strength of the interaction is, uh, you know, strength of substitution with the other products. That first block of four is saying these four products affect each other's sales. OK, that means I know then I only have to take into account the price, the prices of three other products when building a model of any one of those products in that uh, in that first block. I can ignore the prices of the other products in the remaining six products. OK, the other reason why it's useful to identify a block structure is sometimes we might actually want to build a product, build a model not at the individual product level, but at the group of product levels. So in other words, instead of building a single model per row with that matrix, we might want to build a single model per block that we've identified. And that naturally brings me on to the another point in demand modeling is that products naturally or often naturally form into fall into some sort of product hierarchy. Um, often a retailer will give us a product hierarchy, or we may have other means of identifying a product hierarchy um, from some from some other data. In that previous slide, I had identified groups of products uh, or blocks of products, but there can be other higher groupings, such as at a category level or even groups of category level groups of categories. OK, the advantage of identifying this hierarchical structure is I can use it to do things like parameter pooling. So when we're actually estimating the parameters, I might want to say, OK, all the products in a particular group or even higher, higher up uh, in, in the hierarchy have the same parameter. Um, and that means I'm using all the data across all the products in the group to help estimate that parameter. And that's particularly useful when we ha have issues with data quality, say in one product, we might have a limited signal in a particular data series from one product, but we still got the data from the other products to help us estimate that parameter. So knowing the hierarchical structure and being able to use it in parameter estimation is extremely useful because it helps make our estimation process robust. Okay. 
those are the inputs that we need or uh, and you know in, into a demand model and that's you know uh, how we go about building it but as you can imagine there are many challenges when we build a demand model the reality can be very different so what are those challenges um well let's go back to data uh you know i said that we build data build our models using uh historical transaction data um this is some real data um i think i showed it on one of the previous slides but even with this data you can see that there are some challenges so if you look at that orange horizontal that orange line which is showing the price series you can see for this particular product that the price of the product was not changed by the retailer for nearly half that three year period so for 18 months the retailer didn't change the price of the product and yet we're trying to uncover the strength of the relationship between price and sales volume. So modeling this actual data series may actually be quite challenging if the retailer hasn't changed the price very much. But this is what good data looks like. It's in fact not uncommon to see data that looks like this. Again, this is real data. This is a product that was selling very little for virtually all of three years. And then suddenly in the penultimate week, it went through a big spike in sales. Okay. This is not a data quality issue. This is this data is actually accurate. OK, it's just very challenging. But there are other data issues that we can face, other data challenges that we can face when building demand models. So we can actually have issues with um, data quality. It's not uncommon for the promotion data that we're given to be inaccurate or misaligned with the actual sales volume data. We can uh, have things like outliers present in the data series. I've already mentioned about structural breaks being present and how we actually have to uh, work with the uh, presence of structural breaks when building demand models. Um, we can also face challenges when we get products that are only present for a part of the three year period on which we're using for our model training. So for example, products which are delisted, suddenly the sales are stopping. Or you might have a product that's launched halfway through this uh, three year window. So again, we're only getting half, we're getting, only getting sales data for half that three year period. And yet when we're doing, when we're building our demand models, when we're constructing a demand modeling process, we need to have to be able to handle these data, um, data quality and data challenges. And we have to do it in a fairly automated way. That means our demand modeling process looks something more like this it's not just that schematic i had earlier where we've got math inputs going into a mathematical equation it's actually uh you know a you know more than that we have to put these additional components in place these are additional components that help us deal with those data issues so we might have things like a change point detection algorithm to detect those structural breaks uh, in place. We might have outlier detection algorithms to detect outliers, and we may have methods for doing parameter pooling. Okay, so that's one of the challenges. That's the data challenges we face when building demand models. The other challenge I want to highlight is around the operational side, when we start to put these models into production. Um, and that relates to the scale on which we're building these demand models. So for a typical large US retailer, we will be estimating or updating these demand models. We'll be potentially building or estimating around about uh, half a million to a million models. Okay, and we're doing that building or that estimating, that updating process of the estimates, uh, that training process. We're doing that every week because we need our models to be up to date and relevant when we're making our predictions. Um, and we need that whole model building process to fit in an operational pipeline. So that means that updating that estimating process has to fit in an operational window, typically say a, a four to eight hour window. Okay. The consequences of that is that this model process, this model building process uh, cannot break. It cannot fail. We don't have the luxury of having a human in the loop to actually go in and correct models that might have issues with them that might be fail, you know, fail or have some data quality issues that impact them and start cause the models to break. Uh, and the reason we don't have that luxury is because even if only 1% of the models uh, start to break and the human in the loop spends only 20 seconds per model fixing them, that's still about two days of total time fixing broken models. And yet we've got to build the, you know, fit the whole building process into a four, hour, four to eight hour window. Okay. So we can't afford for the models to uh, break. The whole modeling process has to be robust. Okay. 
I'm now going to move on to the actual mathematical forms that we use for these Damar models. Now, you may be wondering at this point why I start talking about the mathematical form of the demand models now. Why not introduce it at the beginning of the talk and then start to talk about the data engineering challenges and so on? And the reason is the challenges with data and the heat operational challenges we face impose constraints on the complexity of the models that we can use. So therefore, I wanted to introduce those data challenges, those engineering challenges, those operational challenges before I started to speak about the actual form of the models we use. But let's move on to those forms, those mathematical equations that we use. And we can basically divide them into two broad categories. We can use either very simple models for doing our demand modeling. These might be classical statistical models where we take the features, the inputs that I've already highlighted, and we combine each feature with some parameter value into a single linear predictor uh, value. And then we might put that linear predictor value into some transformation, uh, essentially we're putting it into a link function. Um, or we might be putting it into some other sort of uh, traditional statistical modeling approach. So we might be doing something like Sorima X. So this is a, a seasonal Arima uh, models with exogenous uh, inputs as well. Or you might be putting it into some sort of multinomial discrete choice model. Okay, there are several pros and cons to using these simple models. Uh, on the on the pro side, on the advantages, obviously these models are easier to interpret. They're fairly easy to interpret, but they're also fairly robust. They're easy to uh, productionize because of their simplicity. They are less likely to go wrong. And it's also easier to add those extra components that I mentioned uh, on top. It's easier to add the change point detection algorithms on top. It's easier to add the outlier detection uh, algorithms uh, in there as well. On the downside, because of their simplicity, maybe these models aren't so great at capturing really um, complex patterns of variation in the uh, in the sales uh, data, in the uh, sort of sales volume uh, variation. Contrast that with more complex, uh, sophisticated models. These might be things like machine learning models, deep learning neural networks, for example. Obviously, these models can capture a lot more complex uh, relationships. So if we've got some really complex patterns of variation in the sales data, maybe these models uh, would do, you know, capture that, uh, you know, uh, more accurately. On the downside, though, they can be more fragile in production um, and we may have issues with interpretability so when we're looking at the parameters okay what is that parameter telling us which you know can be a disadvantage both from you know debugging point of view and also from when we're using these models to extract insight okay we use both kinds of models actually in Dunhumby. Um, so we actually use um, some machine learning models for some of the tasks we do in demand modeling but for the actual prediction of sales volumes we actually tend to use the more simpler uh, model forms mainly because of these constraints around uh, the need to make these mo models robust in production and um, because we tend to use these more simple models i'm going to explain a bit more of the possible model forms that we use for those simple models and so that brings me on to uh, this slide so of the simple models, there are two possibilities we can use for, for modeling. We can either build models of each individual product. And here we're modeling, tend to be modeling aggregate sales volume. Uh, as I said, we've got a very simple um, you know, uh, linear predictor. We're taking our features X and we're combining them with parameters beta into a single number for each product I at a particular time point. And then we might feed that into some sort of transformation function. As I said, these models are very simple. The downside to them is we're not directly taking into account the sales volume of other products when building a model of one particular product. Um, because we're building the models at product level, we're building them one model at a time. And to ex in, explain that uh, more fully, imagine I've got a situation where I've got two products, A and B, and I change the price of product B. I'm now going to build the model for product A, but I'm going to change the price of product B. For the, for the model for product A, the effect that price of product B has upon it comes in via a cross price elasticity effect. Okay. But when I come to model building the model for product B, its own price will affect its sales via a direct elasticity effect. Okay. But those two effects are not necessarily made automatically made to be consistent. 
So in other words, yes, we're taking into account the price of product B in both models, but we're not coupling the models directly when we're actually building them. We can do that coupling as a sort of add on downstream. We can make some impose some parameter constraints to make sure that the levels of sales sort of feed into each model, but we're not building it into the actual mathematical form. And that's because we're building one model per product. An alternative way to do that, and perhaps a better way to do that, is to actually build one model per group of products, what, what we call a need state. So a need state is the group of products that are strong substitutes for each other. And in this case, we might be building a model, we're building a model of a group of products, but we might be building that model where we're modeling probabilities. We're not modeling aggregate sales volume, rather we're trying to model the probability that a shopper buys a particular product I in that group of products. So we're building a multi, we're doing something like multinomial regression, and our probabilities might be something like that familiar softmax function you can see there, where we're just taking the exponentials of those linear predictors. And we've got a normalization factor Z, which ensures that all those probabilities add up to one. But because those probabilities add up to one, it means that the sales volumes are in our models are linked to each other automatically. So as I change the price of one product and its probability go, of purchase goes up, because the probabilities across the whole group have to sign up to one, it means the probabilities of those other products decrease. In other words, changes in the sales volume of one product are automatically, you know, brought in to have an effect upon this effect upon the sales volume of the other products in the group. Obviously, these models are more complex, slightly more complex than those uh, the models on the previous slide. Um, and when we're building these models, sometimes we uh, will make use of uh, things like probabilistic programming languages, such as Stan, to do some of the prototyping for us. Again, these are models that we actually use in, in Dunhumby. There are other advantages to using these kinds of models where we're directly modeling the probability of purchase of the or probability of the customer making a particular decision. And that is sometimes it's also easier to think or reason about how other features might have an effect upon those probabilities. So if I want to add a new feature into my model, uh, I can do that very easily um, because I have, I'm starting to think about probabilities and customer decisions. And as a human being, I've got a bit more insight or feeling for how I, you know, decisions are made. Whereas when I'm modeling aggregate sales, maybe it's less clear. Okay. That's been a very whirlwind tour of demand modeling. Um, so now I'm going to wrap up and give three key takeaways from this talk. Uh, these are the three things I want you to go away and remember from this talk. Even if you remember nothing else, remember these three things. Okay. And the first of which is that, well, demand modeling and grocery retail is actually a relatively mature field. We actually know what the actual uh, relevant inputs are in this case. We don't actually have to do things like a lot of uh, feature discovery, uh, a lot of feature, you know, um, selection. We know what the things which influence uh, the sales of a product are going to be. So that means we actually focus more on, okay, what's the right way to include these features and how should we actually get this to scale uh, appropriately and put these modeling, these modeling processes into operation. Uh, and that brings me on to the second point, the second takeaway. Because we're doing this at scale, because we're doing modeling of grocery retail, and grocery retail is a big business, um, and you know we're running this as part of an operational pipeline, those models need to be robust. We can't afford for the modeling process to fail. One way of doing that is to keep those models simple. The other challenge or the other takeaway that uh, I want you to remember is because we're also using these models across a wide range of different use cases, and some of those use cases might be pushing the modeling models to their, you know, sort of to, uh, I won't say their extremes, but to, you know, they're using them quite a long way out of sample. And again, the models themselves used need to be robust as well. Not just the operational pipeline, but the actual models themselves. The models always have to give sensible output. And one way to do that is to make sure that the mathematical forms we use for those models um, is based upon known causal economic relationships. Okay, so those are the three takeaways. Uh, with that, I will say thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, David. I genuinely think I could have listened to you all afternoon. You've got a, a very, uh, very relaxed approach to it, and it comes across so well. So, yeah, if you've enjoyed that at home, please do drop a little comment in the chat, a little thank you, a little round of applause. Uh, it's always nice. So, 
Um, yeah, I can see straight away there. Uh, we have uh, a comment straight away. Fantastic talk. Love the detail. Uh, fantastic and engaging, engaging presentation. Thank you, David. Excellent presentation with great clarity. So I'll let a few more of those come in. Um, as Dave has mentioned, the Q&A is open. So if you do have questions, we're looking for them. Uh, get, get them in there. Yeah, um, I've got a, couple, uh, got a couple myself um, and uh, we'll, we'll get going. So, um, yeah, David is spotting a few names. You re recognise a few names there, do you, David? Oh, well, I was just going to say, I'm looking through the, the questions in the chat. And the first thing I was going to say, is, you know, a lot, a lot of people commenting on what those, uh, what product it might have been that had the spikes at oh, Christmas. Oh, hang on, let us guess. Um, let uh, us guess. No, no well, I, ca I can't really say, but I can tell you it wasn't Brussels sprouts or turkeys. Uh, my, my guess was school, school like uniforms and stuff like that. No, no? I, I, I won't okay. say for commercial sensitivity okay. reasons, but it's a fairly bland product, actually. Ah, good. Le left us guessing, left us wanting more. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyone that knows David personally, maybe you could catch him and, and get the lowdown uh, 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 beside the NBA and stuff like that. So uh, those comments are all coming in. I will jump back to those and, and pick some of them as they come through. Um, what I might do, David, um, I may get you to stop sharing your screen now yeah, sure. uh, so the people at home can perhaps see us a, a little bit bigger. Um, and then we'll get going from there. So there's some questions in the Q&A. Uh, just to call out, there is the opportunity to upvote uh, as well. So even if you don't have a question, but you like one of someone else's, please, please you know, give it a little upvote and uh, that will help us as well. Um, I think before I get to the questions from the q and I'm going to start with with one of my own, if, if you don't mind, David. The, the perks of being the host, I, I get to yeah. ask the first question. Um, so I'd imagine, obviously, there's a lot of products out there to, to model. And I would imagine some of them are, are perhaps easier than others. Um, are there particular products that are very difficult to model? And, and if so, why? Uh, yeah, so the products that usually are the most challenging are the ones that sell in relatively low volume. Um, and, and the reasons for that, why, they, why they're challenging. Well, first of all, um, you know, you can get products that don't sell for long periods of time. Um, so products which are very intermittent in their sales can always be challenging. And that means we've got very limited signal. Um, so that's one challenge as in, you know, the, 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 the data we get is difficult to work with, difficult to work with. The other aspect to it is um, the models we're actually producing are making predictions about the average level of sales. And when you've got a product that sells in very low volume, so imagine you've got a product that sells only you know, one product every five or six weeks, um, you know, so on average, it's a fifth of a unit per per, per week. So the average, you know, the, the model might be getting that average absolutely spot on. But when you actually look at the real data, the sales volume is going from zeros to ones. So the average, the, the variation in the actual data is, a, you know, quite a long way away from the average. So the model uh, predicts the average. But the actual pattern of sales you see is a long way from that. So in other words, you're seeing a lot of volatility around the mean. And that can be a difficult concept to explain to stakeholders that the model is accurate, but the actual pattern you actually see in the real data is a long way from the prediction of the model. Um, and that's a difficult concept sometimes for non-data non scientist stakeholders to sort of get to grips with. Uh, what it means is we have to then actually aggregate the data and say, look, we're not rather than making a prediction every week, we're going to show the prediction for a three month period. Um, we're going to aggregate the data even to a you know even to a greater a greater scale. So low volume low volume products are always challenging. Um, in supermarket data, yeah, great. You know we're we're often lucky that super, most supermarket products tend to sell in high volumes. But when you get a say a client that's maybe not working in a grocery retail um, you know sector, then that can be a bit more challenging. When you've got you know clients whose products are naturally less frequently selling, that can be the, the most challenging uh, situations we face. Amazing, thanks so much, David. And um, talking about that, then. Um... I must admit, as you started talking, my wife runs a yoga business. So I was thinking, oh, God, it'd be cool to be able to do this for, for her business. And we've got zero chance of, of getting the data. So I've got two, two questions, I guess, following on from that. And, um, you know, in terms of how much data you need, is there kind of any sort of benchmarks that you kind of need to be able to, to work with? And, and if there isn't that data there, for, for the example of a yoga business or a smaller business, could you aggregate data across an industry? um to understand how price impacts and stuff like that so yeah could, could you tell us a bit more about how much data you need and where you can perhaps get that data from if you don't have it yourself yeah okay i mean that's, that's a uh a, that's a slightly difficult question because it can be very very much dependent upon the actual sector and, and, the, and the use case 
I mean, just, just, just in a grocery retail um, setting, I've already mentioned about how we typically work with three years worth of data because we need to actually see these repeats of seasonal patterns in order to estimate the strength of those seasonal patterns. Um, we don't go for much longer data because obviously we can also see patterns change. So we want to use relevant, up-to-date relevant data, but enough up-to-date relevant data that we see the, uh, the, you know, the regular repeats of those, say, Christmas spikes or the regular repeat of that seasonal up and down. On something like a, um, you know, something like your, you know, your yoga business example, it would very much depend upon what level of insight you're wanting to get. Obviously, if you aggregated data across a number of different businesses, your model's only going to be starting to extract data at the level of a sector, you know, yoga business. It's not going to necessarily be, you know, it may be limited in, in how useful it is then for making predictions for a what in an individual specific yoga business. Yeah. Um, also, if you are going to aggregate them, then you and you build a model from uh, that aggregated data. You're probably you know, you're implicitly making an assumption that the way in which all those yoga businesses respond to the different relevant inputs, you know, things like maybe economic factors or price factors, you're making the assumption that you're getting a homogeneous response. It's the same response. The yoga businesses respond in the same way. If one of those yoga businesses is of a very different price sensitivity compared to the others, then aggregating the data across those businesses would probably not be appropriate. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump into the Q&A, actually. So you can read along at the same time uh, okay. if you would like, David. Yeah. Um, I've clicked on order by most upvotes. So uh, we'll maybe uh, work our way down from there. Um, the question at the talk, uh, top, sorry, uh, great question for, from Amy. So th thanks for putting that in there, Amy. Uh, Amy says, thanks for the great talk, David. Uh, how do abnormal events such as COVID-19 impact demand models? Uh, and how do you account for such events when training the models? C can you account for it, <laughs> I guess? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, nasty question. Um, it's obviously something we did have to deal with. So how, how does it impact, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the building of the demand models? It can impact it greatly. Um, but it depends precisely on how that's coming in. So obviously during COVID, a lot of people were doing things like stockpiling. Um, and so sales volume, you know, the beginning of the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, you know, a lot of people stockpiled certain products, things like pasta, toilet roll. Sales volumes go through a, a big spike, you know, a big jump. Um, but as I mentioned, we have algorithms in there that will, do, that will do things like the structural break detection. So we have algorithms that can actually spot the actual jump in sales volume and take it into account when we're building the models. Um, when it comes to actually making a forecast, obviously, you know, we can detect structural breaks in historical data, but we obviously can't detect, we can't make a prediction of when a structural break might happen in the future. We can't predict when the next pa pandemic is going to um, come along. Um, one thing I will mention is, so that's detecting structural breaks in the um, sales volume, but you might also see changes in the actual responsiveness of shoppers. So not only do they change the volumes in which they're buying, they might have also changed the actual price sensitivity. I mean, that was a particularly relevant factor um, when we moved out of the pandemic and started into the cost of living crisis. You know, people's uh, incomes got squeezed uh, and obviously their price sensitivity changes. And so you can see changes in price sensitivity over that three year window uh, in which you're building. That means you actually have to make some of your parameters dynamic. You have to allow these parameters that you're, you're you know, building to your model vary with time. Doing that can actually be very challenging, um, but it is something we uh, do a lot of research into. Uh, I'm, I can't really say more than that, unfortunately. So in answer to Amy's question, yes, it's challenging. Uh, some of the mechanisms I already highlighted can can handle with those with those changes because they can detect the level in, you know, the changes in um, sales volumes. Changes in parameters is harder to deal with. When it comes to forecasting, obviously you can't forecast, you know, forecasting what future, um, you know, one-off events might be occurring total impossibility you know so you know whenever you're making a long-range forecast it's always caveated on this is the scenario if the scenario is very different you know it's going to be a very different output amazing amazing thank you so much 
Um, next question at the top. Uh, I'm going to try and fire for a few, actually, because I'm conscious of time and they, they keep coming in. So um, next question is, do you factor in location for, for demand models? Obviously, you, remember, um, you mentioned that it's you know, global retailers that you work with. Do, do you have to worry about location? Uh, yeah, and, and we do. Um, and it can vary by what kind of clients. So I mentioned about we model at the will typically model at the level of product price zone week level and the price zone is a group of stores that we expect to um we have a single model for and that might be on the basis of that we expect those group of stores to respond similarly to, to price um and the reason you know when we're working out those price zones that can be based upon geography um, because geography is a big influence upon people, you know, on, on price sensitivity. You tend to find, particularly in, in the in the US, you know, in, or in most countries, there might be, um, you know, certain, you know, regions which are more affluent than others. Um, so you can think of the West Coast of America compared to, say, maybe other parts of the United States, incomes being higher, and that can lead to, you know, sort of low, low, lower price sensitivity. In which case, then we would take yeah geography into account when constructing the price zone, and then when we build the models, obviously we're taking price zone into account into in, into the modeling process. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to take the the next question there. Uh, talk about uh, Sarimax. When using the simpler models such as Sarimax, uh, what is your approach in combining all the features in into one? Um, and I'm going to combine that actually with a, a question that was a little bit further down, uh, asking asking. Uh, saying uh, so in summary simple statistical models like Sarimax are more often used than global deep learning uh, models is my understanding correct so could, could you uh, explain a little bit more on both of those please um, yeah so the second question yeah do, do, do we prefer simpler models to, you know uh, to say deep learning models um, yes um, you know because of the we you know we have these issues of that we need the models to be interpretable robust in production at scale um, and, and then we're also going to sort of impose other downstream post-processing calculations on top of these models and it's a lot easier to do that in a model that you can fully understand and interpret um, the first part of the question i can't the first question uh, it's at the top there so if you ordered by most upvotes uh, from adino and um, when using the simpler models such as sarimax what is your approach in combining all the features into one okay so as i mentioned in the in the slides in those classical models we're actually constructing a single linear predictor so it's literally just we're, we're taking those um you know those features those inputs that we know are relevant and just combining them in uh, into a single linear predictor. So with every feature, we've got a, a parameter. Um, we're just multiplying by the parameter and then add, adding up all those uh, effects together. We will do some, there's some, there is some skill in actually, you know, taking, a, 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 you know, we might do some feature engineering around that. Um, so we might go, okay, we know, for example, you know, holidays are a, a feature or a relevant, you know, a factor in affecting demand. We can model that using some basis functions. How precisely we construct those basis basis functions is, you know, something that you know uh, we do a bit of research around. But once we've got the feature values calculated, we're just including them in a single a single linear predictor. We're just modeling them by each each feature value by a parameter and then adding them up. Amazing. Thanks, David. Um, the next question, I suspect a few people will will have actually. So I'm definitely keen keen to ask this one. So again, question from Adino. Uh, any advice for students or graduates uh, who want to be working in roles similar to yours? Uh, for example, are there any projects that you would like to see on someone's CV? Um, so if someone's new to the industry or, or moving in this direction, is there things that you particularly look for in their background? Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to broaden that question out to what kind of qualities do I look for in a data scientist? And I think every data scientist should be capable of doing some basic model building so doing things like some linear regression and some generalized linear, linear model building so i'm looking for someone that they've got an understanding of basic probabilistic concepts and where sampling variation comes from and how you account for that when you're doing um, modeling when you're doing data analysis so yeah i tend to look for i want some basic experience with some model building doesn't have to be demand model building, doesn't have to be time series analysis, but I want some understanding of basic model building. 
amazing. Thank and so, in terms of what project, what projects to you know to work on, anything we can demonstrate those those skills. Perfect. Great, great answer. Great answer. Um, I am conscious of time. Uh, so th there's been a lot of questions and I think everyone built up into the questions actually as you started answering them, they've come in. So we've been inundated. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is actually pull these questions down into perhaps a separate uh, document or perhaps we can turn it into a blog post or a bit of a follow up for, for, from Dunham on it because uh, I, I just uh, sadly uh, have, have run out of time. Um, what I will do is just quickly go through some of these comments again David because they, they yeah. are so good and it, it is nice to know that it's been appreciated and Dunhumby have been appreciated as well so uh, Sophie that was brilliant thank you uh, Andrew thanks for this very engaging useful uh, thank you uh, thank you thank you for the wonderful session uh, thank you it's my first time here I'm glad I joined thank you uh, amazing amazing explanation and presentation very interesting uh, mixed in with even more questions and the list goes on and on so I'm struggling struggling to scroll through it actually David so and um, what I will say just as we do draw things to, to a close with the webinar and um, it is a massive thank you um, first of all David thank you to you uh, for pulling together the, the presentation and um, as mentioned it's been mentioned by a number of people your, your presentation style and approach I think made it very easy for everyone to grasp the concept and, and what you were getting across so thank you for uh, spending the time to prepare and um, the other thing that I really do want to just reiterate is thank you to Dunhumby um, Dunhumby are a fantastic organisation um, and I must admit everyone that I uh, meet from there they're, they're always fantastic and they always seem to have a very long tenure uh, with Dunhumby as well which which always tell, seems to tell you a lot about, about a company and, and they just seem to have such a good approach with everything um, which comes through into supporting the data community. Um, so running the data science festival, running the community, it's very difficult at times, uh, particularly end of last year start of this economically I think it's been quite a tough time for a number of companies um, and Dunhumby have been at the forefront of still supporting and, and making good stuff happen so uh, massive thank you to them and, and obviously to you so um, just to end things how did you find giving that session was it a good practice a good warm-up for, for you yeah yeah no, well, later on? I, well, I, well I always enjoyed talking about science I always enjoy getting the questions actually because you know um you know you there's always uh, insightful questions that I've never thought of before and go, oh, yeah, you know, I haven't thought of it that way. So it's always good to get the questions. Um, I also, yeah, I just like giving back to the community. I, I like the fact that, um, you know, there's people want to learn about this. It's always interesting when, you know, it's always nice when someone takes a piece of, you know, interest in, in, in your work. In terms of warm up for the next session, I'll, I'll find out in about 20 minutes where I've got to give a, a, a slightly shorter version of this talk. There you go. I could have probably kept you on here for another twenty minutes, but I was a bit, I was a bit um, mindful. That they might, my, my company might be wondering where I'm, I'm getting to, where I am at the moment. I think there they're probably go. Yeah, I'll start getting a ping on, on on email in a moment. <laughs> yeah, please come, come. Uh, amazing. So yeah, th thank you to you, thank you to Dan Humby, and thank you all for joining us wherever you are around the world. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you with us, and uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Th yeah. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it.